Welcome to this week's vlog. As you can see, I'm sat in a BMW i8. There will be a vlog coming about the BMW i8 shortly on my channel. But first of all, I just want to give you a bit of a teaser by sitting in it and telling you that it's coming. Thank you to all my new subscribers recently, by the way. If you haven't already, please subscribe. It does help my channel grow. Anyway, this week we will be talking about the top most asked for questions by electric car owners. Number one is how does regen work? And regen works different in every manufacturer. So first of all, I'll explain the one I know best, which is the Renault Zoe. So the way regen works is it puts excess wasted energy back in towards the battery. But like physics, you can't put more in than you took out. So if you have the same gradient hill and go up that gradient hill and go back down again, you will use more power going up than you'll ever regen going back down. Now the way regen does work is as soon as you let go of the accelerator, you'll feel that little bit of resistance start kicking in. And that is the regen. That's, think of it as the motors resisting the power to put the energy back in towards the car. So instead of using your brake pads and your friction materials and wasting that energy as heat, a uh, uh, heat and sound is being put back in towards the battery similar to the way the curve system works in Formula 1 so that energy is being forced back into the car now on the Zoe the regen is not on full when you let go of the accelerator unlike other EVs like the Nissan Leaf and Tesla that when you let go of the brake you're getting a full regen for straight away on the Renault Zoe, the regen is a very, very small amount of regen. To activate more regen, you have to apply a little bit of the foot brake at the start, and that little bit of the foot brake, each little segment of foot brake adds more regen, more regen from the motors, and not using the friction materials. As you get towards the end of the foot pedal on the uh, brake on the Zoe, that is when you start engaging the actual friction materials, the brake discs and pads. But the first part of the brake is actually increasing the regen. This system has a few advantages and one of the major advantages is in snow and ice. Now when our rival owners of uh, Leafs and Teslas go down hills they'll get a little bit more too much regen and they'll get a bit of spinning of the wheels as the wheels start to lock up with the ice and snow. Where the Zoe owners act like any other car rolling down a hill it's almost free rolling. With, uh, it, there's a tiny 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 bit of regen um, but it, it's a little bit more easier to con control because you've got more power more control over it with the brake which makes more sense. In the Obviously in the Tesla, if you've got the two-wheel drive model, you'll get less regen than if you have a four-wheel drive Tesla, and that's because you've got another set of wheels which can power back the battery, um, which, are being, which are connected to a motor, where obviously if you've got two-wheel drive, you've just got one, the, one, the one form of motor being controlled, not, not an extra two wheels. So if you have a four-wheel drive uh, Tesla, you will get more regen than a two-wheel drive. And then the new Leaf, the new Leaf 2.0 as they're now calling it uh, everywhere, the, that has something called the e-pedal. Now the e-pedal is one pedal driving. And the way one pedal driving works is when you let go of the accelerator, it's like putting the brake on. And, and it, you get 100% regen, and I believe a little bit of the friction material will, will start to slow you down as well. And the idea of this is you can just drive the car with one foot. But I believe most of the power will be taken back into regen. Number two, how often should I charge? And there's a bit of a saying on this, and it's called ABC, always be charging. And by that, what I mean is you should always plug in. So when you come home, get your Type 2 plug, and put it straight into your car and charge up every single day. ABC allows you to always be charged when you need that power. So if you come home, you and you plug in the day you, the day you need the car, the day you need that power, it's always fully charged, and that has amazing advantages. One of the main advantages it has, it means you're never flat. It means that if for example, you came home and there's an emergency, you need to go out. Chances are that your car is already fully charged. So, amazing advantage, first of all. Second of all, you don't need to worry about charging to 100% all the time because the BMS looks after your battery. On all the EVs around at the moment, the BMS system will, won't let you actually physically charge to 100%. So, even when your car says 100%, as I mentioned in other videos, you're not 100% charged. You are 100% charged for your usable capacity, what the computer allows you to use, but you're not 100%
charged as in it, the, the, you know, you're not using the full battery charge to 100%. Same as when you discharge to zero, you're never at zero. The BMS system always looks after that bottom part of the range. And that's really important that if, you are, if you're always charging, you're keeping the battery health state always fully topped up. You're not going to do any damage because the BMS will look after it. Obviously, what will happen is your gasometer um, sometimes on the Tesla needs, needs to sort of run down to the top and that allows the battery to work out what the SOH is and whereabouts it sits. And obviously now and again you get the battery balancing cells and stuff like that. But without getting too complicated, if you're always plugged in, you've always got the car available, don't worry about presetting, uh, you know, sort of messing around with your charge, charge time. Because obviously with the Renault Zoe, there is no way to... Uh, preset the car to 100%, 80% charge. It, you plug it in, it charges to what it goes to. With the Teslas, you obviously have the option of what you want to charge. You might say, oh, I want to charge to 80, 90. Um, and Tesla allow the, the Tesla owners to get a bit more. But when you've got a massive capacity battery, if you're only charging to 80, 90%, it doesn't really matter too much to you. But when you've got a 40 kilowatt or 22 kilowatt battery in the smaller EVs, then you do kind of need all your available power Number three, why do electric cars have a 12 volt battery? Now you've probably noticed under the hood or bonnet, if you're obviously UK, uh, there is a 12 volt battery for electric cars. So you have your main traction battery, which is your 400 amp battery, and then you have a little 12 volt battery underneath the bonnet. Now this 12 volt battery is for various parts of the car. One of them is powering the lights, sat-nav, central locking system, basically all the consumable parts of the car that turn it on, allow it to allow the dash to light up, allow the lights to work, allow you to unlock the car by the key. They're all powered by the 12 volt battery. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Number one, it's far easier for the car manufacturers to allow you to plug in your cigarette lighters and charge USBs. It's easier for safer for wiring of your sat nav system. Rather than power off the traction batteries which are 400 volt on most cars, you're powering it off a 12 volt low volt system. So there's a lot less risk to the consumer of touching any dangerous wires. It doesn't matter if the wires break at the back of the car, but, you know, they'll just they'll just sort of earth on the bodywork of the car. So it does make it a lot safer for wiring and stuff like that and plugging in plugging in stuff to 12 volt cigarette lighters. So the, that is the main reason why they have 12 volt systems. The battery, obviously the 12 volt system, you don't have an alternator. So that 12 volt system is topped up from the traction battery. So all the manufacturers have different ways of looking after the 12 volt battery. Now, for example, the Teslas and BMWs, they keep a constant eye on the 12 volt battery and as long as the traction battery is in high health, it will use the traction battery to chop up the 12 volt battery whenever it gets low, there's a low state of charge on it. The Renault battery is a little bit different. Uh, being Renault, they like to make things, you know, not perfect. But I'm, I'm not dishing them, I own, obviously own the Renault Zoe, but what happens with the Renault is the car goes asleep if you don't use it after a week and if your 12 volt battery is left for a number of weeks and it's getting to the end of its life it could go fat, flat and cause what they call the electrical fault on the dash where it says the, the car won't start and you have electrical fault and you have to call the recovery truck what that usually means is the 12 volt battery has gone dead and it's or it's dying and the best way to keep your 12 volt battery topped up on a Renault Zoe is to keep the car awake so every now and again, open and lock the doors, open the door, shut the door, or turn on the, the ignition so it says ready, turn it off, and that will check the 12 volt battery and it will top it up and it will keep it alive and it will keep it healthy. You could, if you're away on holiday, you could uh, go on the app and make your car preheat and, and that will, as long as it's plugged in obviously to the wall, that will uh, suck some more power out your wall, check the 12 volt battery, obviously it will heat your car up and waste a bit of energy, but it will keep your 12 volt in a, in a good order, good topped up. Or if you've got a family relative that's close by, just get them to open the door, shut the door, and that will wake the system up and top your battery up. But the majority of EVs keep an eye on it 24 seven, and as long as the traction battery is in good order, it'll top it up. So if you do go away on holiday, keep your car plugged in, it keeps the traction battery topped up, and it also makes sure your 12 volt battery is looked after. Because nothing kills a 12 volt battery like being left or extreme cold. What effect does temperature have on the battery? Now, it has various effects depending if it's hot or cold. We'll start with, we'll start with heat, for example. So, 
batteries do not like being very hot. When a battery is hot, the cell is degrading inside the chemistry. It's not good for the cell to be constantly hot, which is why pretty much all um, electric cars have a cooling system for cooling down the battery and keeping the heat of the battery in the prime temperatures. And all, man all, all, all the manufacturers have different ways of coping with this. Some of them have uh, like a gel pack. Some of them use the aircon over the over the pack. Some of them just use um, basically put put slits in the car for when the car's driving the heat. The cold drives over the battery. Now, there's there's a couple of ways the batteries heat up. One is ambient temperature outside is very hot. Um, so that that will keep the temperature quite that will keep the temperature hot, but it's usually not enough to damage the cell. It's just usually depending on what country you are. Obviously, if you're, we've got a member in Dubai who's got a Zoe, um, so obviously in hot hot countries, then it might be a little bit of an issue. Um, but the main reason for heat going for the battery is one is obviously rapid charges. If you go to a rapid charger, you're, you're putting extreme current back into the battery, and that can heat it up. The other thing is driving very fast because you're pulling extreme current out of the battery very quick. So anything that makes the battery act in a very quick, non-slow manner will heat the battery up very, very quickly. But there's no need to worry about this heat because it's usually stored out by the BMS uh, system and it will keep the battery cold and cool it down. So as long as you've got a recent uh, electric car, most the most electric cars coming out today, including the Renault Zoe, even the old ones, um, 22 kilowatts like mine, they have cooling, and the cooling will keep the battery in an optimal temperature to keep it safe. And that is the best part about all electric cars is, unlike phone batteries and other type of battery devices, they actually have a system to make sure the battery is in the correct temperature. The other thing that affects battery is cold. Now, cold will aff affect various things of your electric car. One is it will seriously reduce your range, depending on how cold it is. In the Britain, we can get nice cold temperatures, minus 10, minus 7, minus 8. If, if you're getting very, very cold minus temperatures, your range will drop significantly. So in the 22 kilowatt model that I've got experience with, in the summer, it's a nice 85 mile range. In a very, very cold day, minus 5, you're talking 60 mile range. Now, if it's a bit warmer, you're getting closer towards 65, 70. So temperature makes a big difference on your range, a huge difference, which is why all manufacturers now have kind of stopped printing NEDC figures. Well, they still print them because they have to, but they also print realistic real-world range in the summer and realistic real-world range in the winter. And what this does is it gives you a good idea what it will do in the winter so you can buy an EV based on your winter mileage because uh, you know that that will be a suitable car for you in the winter. So that's why they have three range figures now. They, they have the NEDC quoted figure, which is so you compare it against other manufacturers. They have a winter uh, range and then they have a summer range. But the heat and the cold do affect the batteries in different way, and that's just basic chemistry. Number five, for better range, should I use cruise control or cruise limit? Now, first of all, I'm going to explain why cruise control isn't ideal for an EV if you want to maximize your range on your battery. And the reason for this is, if you set cruise control at 70, when you're going up a hill, it will it'll act perfectly. It will increase the speed back up to 70. Great. The only problem with, with, with cruise control is it doesn't see the brow of a hill. So if you're going down a hill, it will not know that you're getting to that brow of the hill. So it will actually, for a temporary moment when you're going down the hill, it will exceed the speed that you've set at 70. So you, you might hit a temporary moment where you're doing 75, but it takes a while for the speed uh, cruise control to bring it back down to the 70 that you've set. If you set on cruise limit, when you get to the brow of a hill, you naturally let off the foot of the accelerator of your, with, your, with, with your foot. You naturally let off the accelerator. You're restricting the power slightly, and that means when you start going down the hill, you can then readjust for the gradient of the hill and what you want to set the speed for. So the way cruise control works is you just set the speed, and it, it just gets that speed and adjusts it automatically, etc. But there'll be seconds where it's out. Cruise limiter, you set the speed, and no matter where you put your foot on the pedal, the maximum you can get to is that speed. So if you set 70, or let's just say you set 30, and you put your foot flat to the floor, it will not go past 30. If you obviously let it up, it will slow down to the point where 30 would normally be on your pedal. So let's just say 30 is there. If you went there, it'd stay at 30. If you go here, it'd go to about 20. So you've got more control over what the speed is and 
it will maximize your range. You'll get a little bit more range. So if try it out. If you've got a, if you've got an EV, try, try try cruise limiter instead for a bit, and you tell me if you think it manages the speed better. I, personally, I think it does. It means you get a little bit more regen when you're going down hills, and you get more power back for your battery. Number six, how do electric cars charge? Now. We'll start off with the Renault Zoe, for example, because everyone knows it charges by its motor. No, no, it doesn't. No, it charges using a charger and it has two chargers uh, depending on which motor you have. So you've got the Q motor and the R motor. So if you buy the Q motor, you get the charger from Conti that charges at 43 kilowatt AC on free phase. And if you buy the R motor off Reynolds, you get the 22 kilowatt charger. You also have another charger on both cars, which is the DC charger for charging from regen. So, let me put this simply if you've got the Q motor, it will charge at 43 kilowatts, but it does not use the motor. It's a separate charger and it's a, it, it basically converts the AC to DC for, you, for your car. Then you have a separate DC to DC for the regen that goes straight to the battery. Other cars also have similar systems. They all pretty much use a charger that just charges the battery. Obviously, different cars have different systems. Uh, the Leaf has, has, I believe also, I think it might even have three. I'd have to double check. I'm not a big Leaf person, so I don't know a lot about Leafs, but I presume it'll have uh, Chadimo DC to DC, uh, AC to DC, and then it might even have another one for regen, but I don't know. If you do know, please leave a comment in the section below. I'm always interested to find out more about the other electric cars that I don't actually uh, drive or study. Thank you for watching this week's vlog. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget I've got a review coming on this car in a couple of weeks, which is the BMW i8. And again, thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon.